So we are getting to the end. It's, uh, it's great to see that uh, the room is full uh, because this is the key moment of the conference. Is the moment in which we sit together, get together to listen to the talk of our senior award of 2017. And this is a very important moment for us because it's when we uh, select a single person, a scientist, to represent our field at the highest level. Uh, this is a very significant moment, but it's also a difficult election. And I'm really very uh, honored and happy uh, and uh, grateful to the selection committee and the chair of selection committee is Bonnie Berger because selecting a, a single person to represent us as a senior award is a difficult task that requires a lot of, a lot of time and concentration. So thanks to the award committee. So this, this year, senior award goes to Pavel Pesner, uh, representing uh, one of the uh, areas of uh, computational biology, I would say the more uh, algorithmic and uh, mathematical and hardcore part of computational biology. I cannot uh, uh, do this uh, presentation without uh, mentioning his very provocative book. He has this very nice book about mathematics and algorithm molecular and uh, computational biology with this final chapter four pages saying all what you need to know about molecular biology. <laughs> that I think I always use this in my, in my, uh, in my classes. So, uh, Pavel Persner has a PhD in mathematics and physics by the Moscow University in Physics and uh, Technology. He made a, a postdoc with Mike uh, Waterman, that is one of our uh, uh, already is one of our senior award uh, winners and uh, it's the first time I think that we have uh, a successive uh, generations uh, of award winners but also speak about how Jan is computational biology and bioinformatics. After his postdoc, he's now Howard Hughes investigator and professor in UCSD. He has, they, he has done fundamental contributions to the algorithms on uh, in problems on uh, uh, assembling, uh, tree building, and chromosome evolution. He's now interested in uh, uh, something that he described, if I understood correctly, like trying to understand all the details of the evolution of the human chromosomes, but also in other things like antibody design. I think that one of the wonderful things about computational biology, and more, even more when you work at the more mathematical and algorithmic level, is that you can go from one field to the other, and this is one of the things that I think makes more attractive his profile, and one of the things that makes more interesting for us uh, to follow him as a role model. Uh, without more uh, to say, I just want to welcome Pavel Persner uh, as the Senior Award winner 2017. Welcome. All yours. Thank you, Alfonso, for a very kind introduction, and thank you to the Society for selecting me for this award. I am honored and humbled. But in all fairness, the award goes to my students. And I tried to put all of them on a single slide, and I failed. And that's why I only was able to put all students who has chosen a teaching career, career at various universities, and that will come na later. So when these bright young people joined my lab, they naively thought that I will teach them something. In reality, they taught me, and they were doing all the job. And also, I wanted to thank my teachers. And this is my high school teacher. And at the same time, it's one of the greatest mathematicians of the last century and the founder of algorithmic probability theory, Andrei Kalmagorov. So I had an enormous privilege 
of having Kalmogorov teaching two times a week my, uh, my class through entire high school. The only problem was Kalmogorov being a genius spoke twice faster than a normal person. And that's why I had learning breakdown in the beginning of every lecture he had. And I was not alone. Most of my schoolmates had the same learning breakdown. And he is, I was 15 years old, this is December 31, lecture notes of Kalmogorov's lecture on projective geometry, and he is about to prove this arc theorem. This is not quite high school topics, but it still does, did not excuse us from having these learning breakdowns. And sometimes at ISMB, I had a deja vu. After 30 years of working in the field, I, fail, I have learning breakdowns in at least half of ISMB talks. Who have similar experience? Please, please raise your hand. So am I alone here? Oh my God. So something is wrong. And I would like to make, in the end of this talk, I would like to make a proposal on how to change the conference, the format of the conference, so we get rid of these learning breakdowns. And with all the struggle in the high school, I still was able to graduate from university. But my road to bioinformatics was not straight at all. I started working on combinatorial methods for flows in network, in ra railroad network. And I was very close to my PhD thesis, and then I realized I'm not in love with these railroad transportations. And I decided at that time I was still relatively young, I decided the life was too short. You need to find something you will fall in love. And I'm enormously grateful to this man. I started shopping for new area. I knew nothing about bioinformatics. I knew nothing about biology. I had no clue how many amino acids I brought in, I built from. And Andrei Mironov spent half a year with this total stranger talking about some futuristic non-discipline. Probably 100 people worked in this discipline in uh, 1985, which was extremely up, uh, obscure corner of science. And in the same day, I basically joined his lab and started working on my PhD. And I finished my PhD in three years. And I was, when I talk to students, I often tell them, one of the most important things in your career is the choice of the topics you work on. I was incredibly lucky in selecting my topics because I still work on them. So my PhD consisted of three chapters. The first one was using De Bruyne graph for genome assembly based on sequencing by hybridization. Sequencing by hybridization as a technology spectacularly failed. So I had to wait two decades until next generation sequencing emerges so the ideas that I was developing actually became relevant. I actually had two advisors. Another was, was Maxim Frank Kamineski, who is now at Boston University. And with Maxim, we were working on protein sequencing. This is late 80s. Mass spectrometry was in infancy. Tandem mass spectrometry was not even developed. I'm still working on this topic today. And once again, I had to wait two decades until mass spectrometry matured. And antibody sequencing, at least monoclonal, became possible. And we worked on, finally, I had the possibility to return back to this topic. And today, monoclonal antibody sequencing is routine. This is a, I already described two parts of my three-part PhD that were completely disconnected from each other. But I haven't described the third part because nobody works on this problem anymore. It was a terrible choice of topic. But it was one of the hottest problems in bioinformatics 30 years ago. So allow me to tell you what this problem is, because thanks to this problem, I actually uh, met my other teachers that I'm very grateful to. So 
when I started working in bioinformatics, I knew nothing. And the only place I can read all journals with this bioinformatics paper I was interested in, I spent the next few months in this beautiful neoclassical building across the street from Kremlin. It is the Lenin Library. I almost lived there. But guess what? Three months later, I knew everything about bioinformatics. Probably today there are more papers coming out in bioinformatics in a week that I had to read in these few months and to cover everything. And I already had my heroes afterwards. I knew whose work I actually wanted to follow. And there was one more thing. Lenin Library, as beautiful as it was, we're getting all the journals with these two, three years delays. And I was very eager to learn more. So I started sending postcards to my heroes, begging them to send the papers to me. Why postcard? There was still Iron Curtain. I was not allowed to send personal communication. I was filling postcard, sending them to my KGB department. A KGB department checked that I didn't put anything wrong there and was sending this to the scientists. And people were incredibly generous. I was getting these packages with just papers published in the last two years, two, three years. But one person was generous beyond all bounds. He also sent me many unpublished manuscripts. And most of them I couldn't possibly read. They were too complicated for me. But one of them I could actually read because that was the third chapter of my PhD. And that was about the double digest problem, one of the coolest problems in bioinformatics at that time. And a double digest problem, you have, you have a genome, you have restriction enzyme A, cut your genome, collect the sizes of the fragment. You have restriction enzyme B, cut the genome, collect the sizes of the fragment, and then apply both A and B together, collect the sizes of the fragments. You have three towers, given the three towers, reconstruct the restriction map of the genome. Difficult combinatorial problem. And in, the pay, in the, one of these manuscripts that I've got, there was an open problem about this double digest problem. And I spent the next half a year trying to solve it and finally solve it. So I probably don't want to bother you with this description of what kind of open problem it is in the language of physical map, but I will give you equivalent problem in the language of sequences, because everybody here is an expert in, on sequences, right? Anyway, here is a string genome, and there are two interleaving repeats, red repeat and purple repeat. And there are this blue and green fragment flanged between this repeat. If you transpose them, you have a new sequence, and no doubt, five mere composition of the new sequence is the same. It did not change. You did some rearrangement, but the set of five mirrors in your sequence did not change, right? Okay. And S. Kukanin in 1992 came up with an open problem that stated that every true strings with the same K-mere composition can be transformed into each other by trans with the same came, can be transported into each other by transposition, by these operations. It turned out that Mike Waterman, who sent him, me his, his unpublished manuscript, didn't know anything about Ukanin's conjecture, but he was working on absolutely equivalent conjecture in terms of physical map, and he came up with the Schmidt, Schmidt Waterman, not Smith Waterman, Schmidt Waterman conjecture. Uh, and once again, that every two physical map can be transformed into each other with this transformation. Now, it was, timing was perfect because after I was able to solve this problem, I was able to send the solution, almost handwritten, to Mike Waterman because it was perestroika. Iron curtain was falling and I was able to bypass my KGB department. And I basically wrote to him, look, all your map transformations and string transformation are simply some transformation of already, uh, alternating cholerary and passers, and here's the theorem. Later, Mike confessed to me that he didn't understand anything 
because the letter was written in such a bad English that it didn't make any sense. But nevertheless, he invited me to join his lab, and that's how I ended up in the United States, and uh, I benefited greatly from learning many things from Mike. Okay, let's talk about the queen and the servant dilemma. Definitely, when, bioinformati when I entered bioinformatics, we were servant. We didn't even think about anything beyond this. Our only goal was to make biologists happy. Because they were spending weeks trying to build a single double digest map. So when I came up with the program for doing this, they thought it's magical. They never used any programs before. And I think something is happening in our field, maybe in the last 10 years. And I wanted to discuss it. Maybe we are moving from this servant role. Anyway, I also see that the conference is a kind of passive. So if you have any question, I, I don't want it to be a traditional lecture. If you wanted to turn it into a discussion, please go ahead and ask me questions right during the lecture. Probably many of you know this quotation from Gauss. Mathematics is the queen of the sciences. This is not the full citation. Who knows the full citation? Some, some, nobody knows the full citation. Okay. Here's the full citation, a little bit politically incorrect. She often condescends to render service to astronomy and other natural sciences. So if I simply paraphrase Gauss, then the statement will be like this. Bioinformatics is the queen of biology. She often condescends to render service to genomics, proteomics, and other omics. This is extremely politically incorrect. <laughs> right. That's why, allow me to rephrase this. I would argue that bioinformatics is, is the queen and a proud servant of biology. And I argue that it's not only a servant, but also entering in the roles that mathematics play for other scientists. Because one thing the servant can never do with his boss. Servant can never argue with the boss. Servant can never say the boss that the boss is incorrect, right? And I see more and more examples when we tell biologists that they are incorrect. And I wanted to tell you about some examples that I experienced in my work, and I'm just some modest example, and I'm sure there are many such examples. And I was actually, in my work, I was amazed to this standard of truth in biology. There are definitely laws in computational sciences, and I think it's a two-way street. I think biology can, country, can benefit a lot from learning the standard of truth in mathematics and other disciplines. Anyway, so let me tell you about some my experience of how I was finding something that was sort written in stone biological dogma and how they falling apart after bioinformatics analysis. At this conference and at many others, we talk a lot about gene expression, but what we really care about is protein expression. We cannot talk about protein expression if we only talk about gene expression because protein half-lives vary widely by five orders of magnitude. And I was interested in the problem how can you, can you predict protein half-life from the sequence of the protein? Now, we also learn from the book that all proteins start from methanin, right? This is wrong. Most of human proteins do not start from methanin. You probably think I'm crazy, but I'm not. Because there is this magical process that's called N-terminal methionine excision, or NME, and it looks like, that removes leading methionine, and it looks like, like unnecessary decoration on the protein. Why? Why it may be important? It is extremely important because it's universally present in all species, and knockouts of enzyme a little, always. So it's extremely important thing, but it was for a long time, it was mysterious. So what does it do in some proteins? Now, 
This is also one of the most precise biological processes known. Because to cut or not to cut methionine is fully defined by second amino acid in a protein. It's very important. And if second amino acid is one of the seven shown in blue, methionine is cut. If not, methionine stays. What for? So Alex Warshawski is a brilliant scientist at Caltech. He got uh, recently the Breakthrough Prize. And in 2004, he barely missed the Nobel Prize for protein degradation. To the point that a number of celebrities wrote a letter to science shown here, arguing that it was a mistake of Nobel Committee not to award the Nobel Prize to Alex Warshawski. And his pioneering work included, among other things, they celebrated the NN theory. And the theory connected and terminal methionine excision with this half-life of proteins. Because now you have seven plus one different starting amino acids and you can vary half-life. And Ralph Bradshaw was another scientist at UCSF who contributed to this connection biochemically uh, between regulation of protein half-life. So that was a 30 years old theory that four years ago we refuted by analyzing a billion mass spectra over hundreds of species. And it turned out that enemy plays completely different role. The only role it plays is to cut out methionine before alanine and serine to expose them for a very important post-translational modification called N-terminal acetylation. Also mysterious, but well known. What are other, there are seven uh, amino acids in blue. What they're doing? They're simply innocent victims because their sizes are simply smaller than the size of alanine and serine. And that's why they also participate in this. So we were very pleased with this, but we are also very pleased that our cause was, it's the same man, Ralph Bradshaw, the same man who actually originated the theory. So this is one example. Let me give you another example. The master alu repeat theory originated by Mark Badzer, also about 30 years ago. A single master alu repeat have colonized the human genome. With Alkis Price, Elias Areskin, we showed that it cannot be true bioinformatically if you look carefully at the structure and the mutations in all ALU repeats. And we published a paper in November 2004, but we were scooped by one month. Somebody published a paper in October 2004 refuting the master ALU theory. And this person was Mark Badzer, who originated the master value theory. So this list continues. Like if you take random breakage uh, model of chromosomal evolution, 40 years old theory, cited in over thousands of paper, wrong. It doesn't meet, it doesn't uh, withstand. And essentially algorithmic analysis that uh, was originated uh, some time ago with my former student, Sridhar Hanin Hali, who is in the room and later completed with Glenn Tesla. Let me tell you about the recent, the latest development that actually was finalized a month ago. So this was the news that was on in, in all newspapers and on all TV channels. Scientists sequenced protein from dinosaur, and this protein turned out to be so similar to chicken, and it's finally the proof that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Molecular proof that birds evolved. A series of science papers. Right afterwards, we published a letter in Science revealing rampant computational mistakes in the paper and also complaining that the author never released the data after many requests. So after this paper, it was impossible not to release, and they released. And three days later, scientists found not only collagens in 70 million years old fossil, but also hemoglobin, a short-life protein 
from ostrich. We wrote another letter to science telling the paper should be withdrawn. That was never accepted. So in 2010, it was never accepted. Science continued publishing papers on proteins from dinosaurs. Finally, last month, we were vindicated. When scientists in UK finally sequenced ostrich, and it turned out that all dinosaurs protein identical to ostrich collagen. How can it be that there was no single mutation over 70 million years of evolution, particularly, particularly because Mary Schweitzer actually published a paper about ostrich some time ago before she published a paper about dinosaur. That's why Guardian last month wrote how an ostrich halted plans for a real life Jurassic Park. Okay, so standards of proof. I was, I personally was amazed that standards of proof so with respect in certain, at least in some biological areas I worked on, were extremely low. And it provides us with a wonderful opportunity to examine and check the conjecture, various conjectures. And if there are no questions about this part, I wanted to talk about another very old dogma. Very old dogma. Any questions? Okay. What do you think is the longest living medical technology through the course of human history? What technology was in use for longest time? Bloodletting existed for 3,000 years and disappeared only 1,000 years ago because it was absolutely useless. But why doctors for 3,000 years were using this technology? Because they never raised question whether it does anything and because there was no alternative technology. What is the most popular technology in education? It is a thousand years old traditional classroom. Have we ever raised a question about whether it's really working? Particularly in view of my learning breakdowns and as you raise your hands, your hands, your learning breakdowns. Particularly in view of my struggle at Kalmagorov school. And is there an alternative technology? And Sidney Presley famously said, 80 years ago, education is one major activity which has thus far not applied ingenuity to the solution of its problem. And I completely agree. After I suffered all these learning breakdowns, starting from my high school, I was working in the class as if nothing happened and using the same approach that spectacularly failed on me. And that's how we teach. Who knows where this image came from? Anybody knows? Many, oh, many, most, maybe half of this room saw this image. Yes, it's a brilliant Brothers Coin movie, A Serious Man. And those of you who saw the movie, remember that it didn't end well for this professor. What is in common between these four professions? They all either disappeared or about to, get to disappear. And what I wanted to talk about is whether we... <laughs> whether we will eventually disappear. Wouldn't it be wonderful if professors disappeared, it will be substituted for something even more efficient. Education would become so cheap. But there is this important thing that, in fact, there is alternative technology coming to market. And it started maybe five years ago with this 
MOOC revolution. There is enormous amount of uh, MOOCs available, and it forced many of us to think where called traditional college is doomed. But there were immediately voices explaining that it's just a hype. And everything that we have as MOOCs is just low quality, some uh, junk food of education. And the main argument is of this uh, critics is that classroom instruction provide optimal form of learning, right? This is blatantly wrong. And this has been known in educational psychology for three decades already. Benjamin Blum demonstrated that traditional one-to-many classroom is minimally affected. Who is Benjamin Plum? The giant of educational psychology of the last century. And among his many arguments, I, I will only focus on one. It makes no sense to expect all students to take the same amount of time to achieve the same educational objective. Anybody disagrees? They are all different, particularly in this room, because we all have different backgrounds, biologists, physicists, computer scientists, mathematicians. We learn with different speed. We have all different learning breakdown. But there is another very important argument that classroom instruction, in difference from MOOCs, uniquely personalized learning. So when professor walks in the classroom, there are sparks flying and students are excited. <laughs> Give me a break. In a 300 student classroom that became the standard in public American university? And how about the evidence otherwise? And the key problem here is that maybe these large hoarding classrooms work in humanities or in history, but they do not, we all know, they do not work in complex disciplines like mathematics, computer science, physics, technology. Because we all go through this learning breakdown that I experienced from my high school. And as soon as we have our first learning breakdown, since it's sequential distribution of knowledge, they are unable to follow. And most of the learning actually happening outside the classroom in these disciplines. There is an enormous amount of time where students has, has to struggle alone without any professor. Solving homework without help, all that's where most of efforts goes. So to summarize, most instructors teach to only a certain percentile of the class. Instructors lack information about the learning breakdown of individual students. And individual, needless to say, individual students do not receive the immediate attention they should get when they address their learning breakdowns. I sometimes think whether Kalmagorov really knew that we all have learning breakdowns in the very beginning of his lectures. But we were too shy. We would never tell him that we didn't understand. That's why it's very important to share breakdowns. Anyway, so now let's talk about this alternative technology, MOOC, and all of its disadvantages. This is something I call a hoarding classroom. When you pack students, huge number of students, and professors do one too many communications that can be well substituted by simply video. Uh, and when I started looking at MOOCs four years ago, I realized that MOOCs are even worse. Most MOOCs are essentially hoarding classes, but not with 300 students, but with 30,000 students. So they have roughly the same disadvantages of the hoarding classes often. And that's brought Moshe Wardi, one of, of uh, leading computer scientists, to say, if I had my wish, I would wave a wand and make MOOCs disappear. Because similarly to me, he hated this. However, there is a similarity between this statement and a statement that was made 500 years ago by a leading philosopher of the time. And we don't know this, but when printed book came up, most scholars backslashed against it. 
in the same way that many professors today do not like online education. And indeed, I understand why. I'm actually with, on the same page with him. What would you prefer? Would you prefer beautiful, illuminated Renaissance manuscript or the first ugly printed Bible with as many misprints? But let's think about where technology will bring us and about the books that we are able to publish today. So they were judging, both smart and Trepanius, were judging the current state of technology. They didn't think where technology will move. So which would you prefer? An intimate, fantastic class in a small and extensive public, a private college, or this hoarding room in private university, which is the workhorse of American education, at least. I can tell you what I would prefer for my children. I would prefer this, but I cannot afford it. And even if I was able to afford it, probably there is not enough teachers to do this. And that's why I think the only thing that we can do is to substitute this wonderful teacher by a machine. But we are skeptical about machines. But can we substitute it by a machine that can provide instruction that are even better than one-on-one -on -one education? And I would argue that, at least in my case, I definitely feel there is already a machine that is better than me. So let me tell you, and we call it uh, massive adaptive integrative text, and it's not a text, it's not a book, it's not a MOOC, it's something different. And um, it is intelligent tutoring system. So, uh, and we started working on this uh, uh, MATE uh, four years ago. We haven't finished yet, we are in the very beginning, but three years ago we published MOOC books. I believe it was the first book, textbook, specifically written for MOOC, not for the classroom, but for the MOOC. And uh, two years ago, we already pub we published the second edition. I published three textbooks before. It, I realized how bad they are. If you use it, in the, it, say we are used in over 100 universities worldwide, please stop doing this. These are bad books. And we were very pleased, usually books are adapt adopted five, ten years after the book, textbook came out. We were very pleased with this very fast adoption of this book. And what I very quickly realized that for me, it's the end of a classroom. Because it is better than me. Because I cannot possibly invest and bring all the infrastructure that was built for this into the classroom. And it's not only me, there are people at different places that now teach for this book, and this is taken from the class syllabus. Class meeting time will not be the lecture time. Why? Why is it important? Because by watching me now, live, we are not benefiting at all compared to a video lecture. There is no communication between us. Nobody asks questions. So what... What I think is very important is to free the class time for real communication with the student, for interaction with the student. And that's what people do when they flip classes and ask students, you prepare for the class before the class. You solve homework. It's, don't even get me started. Given the class, people already have learning breakdown. A week later, given homework that is addressed, designed to fix this learning breakdown. And maybe a week later, returning this homework back. So finally, two weeks later, breakdown is fixed, but student already went through two weeks of classes that student doesn't understand. Anyway, I didn't say yet, what is this massive adaptive interactive text? And first, this vision, romantic vision of a professor going to a sabbatical in Prague and working in a cafe to write his next book or prepare his next course is gone. Some MOOC developers complain that it takes enormous amount of time to develop a MOOC. 
There are some research, early research, hundreds of hours, let's say 500 hours invested into MOOC. Hundreds of hours. Can you disrupt a thousand years old technology by investing hundreds of hours of time? MOOCs will require, for discipline of these hundred thousand students, MOOCs will require thousands of hours to develop, and we, we meaning a large team, invested over 7,000 hours already in the development of the MATE. And uh, the team include many people, like uh, CEO of on online content delivery companies who started a company, invited lecturer, chief assessment uh, pro, and many, many people uh, that contributed to this. I was very fortunate to work with many of them. It cannot exist without fully automated system for checking homework. And we are not talking about uh, questionnaires that barely check whether a student fall asleep or not. I'm talking about, in, by informatics, I'm talking about programming challenges. Something that you can only implement if you understand that you passed your learning breakdown. And a lot of effort went into uh, development of Rosalind system uh, that essentially automated program checking systems that issued special no two students get the same uh, the same instance of the homework and it was quite successful there were many more students using the system uh, but they're using this through as a uh, portal as a content delivery system uh, more advanced now and we were very pleased that over 150 instructors actually tried the system in their classes. Anyway, how it works, are, students are constantly bombarded with these questions when they go through the system. Why? Because we need to know where they stand and whether they have already experienced learning breakdown. Because they often do not realize that learning breakdown is already there. So, and of course it's a lot of work and that's why we were very fortunate to be supported by various funding agencies, it cannot be done simply as kind of initiative or a hobby. Anyway, just to take you, to show you how the system works roughly, let me take you through a real example. We'll take just one chapter and we take 20 minutes, first 20 minutes of traditional lecture. And I will show you how this 20 minutes of this lecture are transformed into a mate. So this is a traditional lecture. I communicate basically four ideas, let's say, during the first 20 minutes. And then a week later, I give homework, students go solve homework at home. Nonsense. So we start from incorporating programming challenges into the content. So students don't go to read next unless we really check the student understands the concept. And then we embed challenges, exercises, discussion question, and we add FAQs everywhere. So student push a button help and FAQ pops up. Okay. But now, after all this hard job, hard work, students go through the system and has a learning breakdown. What do we do? We go back to this cafe in Prague and write additional remedial model to help this specific student. I could not ever have imagined after quarter of century of teaching what kind of background breakdowns my students have. And I assure you, you don't know either. So I actually, I never actually saw a professor who has, for let's say a course of algorithm, a small compendium of learning breakdowns consisting of just let's say 100 learning breakdowns that students commonly have. It's like SNPs. More than 1% of population, more than 10% of population. What are this learning breakdown? And running the first MOOC for tens of thousands of students was a wonderful experience because it returned us back 8,500 discussion forum. We went through all of them and we changed the content and we developed this remedial mode for every learning breakdown that we ever experienced. We have additional text, additional problems, homework. So, that's how it works. The next learning breakdown, once again, problems. Now, now students go through this remedial prob uh, model, and in this remedial model, students have problem. 
You need to write remedial model for remedial model. Continue further and further. That's how 20 minutes of lecture look like if you think seriously about the population of students who are listening to your lecture. But after you've done it, you map every student to unique path. And every student is a path in this graph. Right? We can learn a lot about from these passes. And when you have many such passes, so this is a pass. And after we learn about these passes, they actually, the work is about to begin. Because now you can build compendium of errors. What are all these types of errors that students do solving each of, let's say, programming challenges? Very simple programming challenge. Find all occurrences of a word in a text. More professors probably would think there is no program. Something wrong? Yes. <laughs> oh. oh, how long I've been speaking without microphone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and now you are back to the drawing board because you need to figure out compendium of errors for every problem. And after you build, and for this simple problem, you actually have, and the list goes on, quite a number, let's say 10 different errors that students commonly make. And for each of them, you design a suite of 10, 20 test cases to figure out where student actually had, what kind of error student actually had. So this is, this is 20 minutes of traditional lecture. And you can imagine that it translates into like hundreds of hours of development. How can I possibly compete with the system as a professor? Anyway, do you hear me now? Okay. Anyway, what I think is very interesting about such development is that compendium of learning breakdowns and compendium of errors allow us to transform every student in a pass, into a learning pass. And imagine what would happen if in addition to our genomes, we will also have our learning path through our entire life. And maybe, just maybe, with this learning path, we would be able to decide whether it makes sense for somebody to focus on railway transportation or on bioinformatics. Anyway, uh, the adaptive MOOC that I described, the first adaptive MOOC, will start uh, uh, in called in very uh, initial introduction to genomics diet size. We start in EDX this fall. And I believe it's actually the first adaptive MOOC at the, for a complex discipline. The were adaptive MOOCs with this huge investment in some introductory class, let's say, at the level of high school geometry. But at the level of complex discipline, it is the first adaptive intelligent tutoring system. And another very important question is, you want to make this system modular. So you don't want them to look uh, very sterile. You want them to look like this so every professor can contribute whatever models and whatever interesting approaches uh, this professor uh, is working on. Anyway, back to uh, this Bloom conundrum. I'm not saying that we have the same fate that taxi drivers and fast food cooks, but I think it's time for us to think on how we teach our classes. Uh, it's time for us to think about what are inefficiency of the current traditional model and whether it is possible to, let's say, start flip classes or introduce work on uh, uh, new approaches to education. And in our experience, it was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun, particularly when I was meeting thousands of students here who took these classes. Uh, and each of these topics actually take two weeks on Coursera. 
And when we ask our students, many, many professors think that MOOC is simply video recording of lectures. It's completely wrong. Video recording takes a small fraction of time invested into MOOC 2.0. And when we ask our students what is more valuable, lectures or interactive text, interactive text won by a high margin. And we were very pleased that despite the fact that students had to work hard 12 hours a week on average, according to our questionnaire, they actually rated course quite well. And what I learned for myself is I cannot teach anymore. I cannot give traditional classroom lecture anymore. And I haven't given a single lecture in my university for three years now. And I haven't been fired yet. <laughs> and also a maid is 24-7 teaching assistant. Instead of students doing mundane work of checking homeworks, you completely freeze them from homework assignment and they interact with students. So I know every student in my class by name in two weeks because each of them has a name tag. And I call them in the class. I reserve the right to call any students in my class at any moment. I would love to use this right in this room, but I'm probably too, too much here. And no name tags. Anyway, uh, the most important thing, I finally, after 25 years of teaching, I started communicating with students. I only walk to the class to talk to them, to answer their question, to discuss something. And uh, I, I would love to talk with my high school teacher about, I would, give, would love to give this lecture to my high school teacher, but I'm confident that if Karl Magorov was alive today, in addition, he, I met him because at the ripe age of 50, actually at the ripe age of 17, he outlined his life for the next, for the rest of his life. And in his plan, when he wrote at the age of 17, it was written, at age 50, stop doing mathematics and focus on education. And he did exactly this. At age 50, he basically withdrew himself from active mathematics, still developed Kalmogorov complexity at that time, afterwards, in free time, but focused basically on his boarding school, mathematical boarding school at Moscow State University and taught that it was his baby. But I'm sure that if he would be doing this again, he would establish also online school. And now let me get back to this idea of how we should change ISMB. Give every speaker a right to flip the talk. What is happening now? We just had extremely passive lecture. You didn't think that I wasted time of my lecture by essentially preaching from the podium. Instead, I could record this lecture, make it available to all of you, and you would be asking me question. Currently, what is happening? If uh, audience is lucky, then uh, a speaker talks for 18 minutes, and then there are two minutes for the question, sometimes random one. So if, if a speaker wants to flip the presentation, let them record the presentation. Let them, make, let them make slides and paper available so people can come prepared. And a speaker can maybe talk for five minutes or 10 minutes, whatever the speaker prefer, and let the audience to ask questions and interact for the next 10 minutes. So turn it into something more animated. And with this, I wanted to thank my partner in crime, Philip Campo, who is now at Carnegie Mellon, who's been working with me for four years now on development of online courses. And also Nima Moshri, who is here. And uh, we launch our course, Analyze Your Genome on EDX this fall. And also I wanted to thank all my teachers Andrei Kalmagorov, Andrei Mironov, Maxim Frank Kamenetsky, and Mike Waterman. I wanted to thank all the uh, students and postdocs in my lab who are now teaching at various universities. And I also wanted to thank very talented people from my lab who decided to go to industry. 
uh, and became very successful or uh, doing postdoc right now. Uh, and I saw the whether I actually put my current students also on a slide. And I have six of them graduating next year. But I decided not to do this because they still believe that I'm teaching them something. So I better not to put them on the slide. Uh, and with this, thank you for listening. Now we are going to look very bad if we don't have a lot of questions. So please. For... Thank you for an excellent talk and thank you for bringing right here. Hey, interacting with the hand. <laughs> the topic of active learning and how we really want to change learning and how important that is and how we shouldn't really waste time lecturing. But I'm going to be the devil's advocate and I'm going to say there's no substitute for human interaction. However, the teacher doesn't have to be an expert, and it doesn't have to be the professor. And you can put 15 students together with a facilitator that will just make sure that they don't go off the train and let each student have 14 teachers. So, how do you see in this world driven by technology the human interaction component it's, not being lost. It's wonderful to bring 14 students in the same room and make them interact with each other. And that can be done either offline or online. And we saw online friendship that goes so strong in our courses that I wonder whether they may be stronger than some offline friendship. So I don't see difference between offline and online interactions in our age, when our children spend so much time on the Facebook, probably more time than they spend time playing in the playground. Looks like I didn't answer your question. <laughs> No, no, I think it's more of motivation, but I think there's been some research showing that, that the type of social interactions that you get, life with a person, are not the same. So being off offline, great help, still done. You still learn better and you still you learn other things on top of the material, right? Uh, that there's just no substitute for interacting physically with people. Absolutely. I'm not proposed to close universities. I'm just telling that university classes that pack 300 students in a single classroom should be considered like unusual punishment. And it probably, and it's probably, they will probably disappear. Hopefully, they will disappear. So I think a more efficient, like you are saying, interactions are important. Yes. Let professor walk in the classroom and interact, because currently they don't interact. They preach from the podium. Because the, the number of questions in a 300 people classroom is minimum, and we just prove it. There were no questions. I invited people to ask questions. Nobody asked questions during my lecture. But now we have more questions over there. Thank you. Pavel. So we have more questions on the other side. Hi, Pavel. On the other side. They made me move up here, Pavel, in the back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On your left. Your left, up the stairs. <laughs> okay. Go on. Okay. So, Pavel, um, awesome talk. To, I'm sure you agree with this because it's the same point you're making, but I have an additional point. So, just as I say, most everyone learns to read by third grade. If people learn in a different way or they're slower, they're kind of tracked differently. And what is there to ensure the privacy of what path in the graph people fall into? So it won't be used to kind of track or slot them because what really matters is whether they learn to read or not. I, I think this is a very important ethical question. Maybe, just maybe, even more important than medical privacy. 
because it has enormous implication for hiring people and for uh, other issues. But I really don't know how to answer this. Who owns the learning uh, pass? The school or the uh, 10 years old student who is going through this learning pass? I have no doubt that students will be eventually going through learning through these uh, passes. And there are a lot of efforts in American high schools to go online. Because even existing online systems are better than many professors, than many high school teachers already. Why not just protect the black box and take an exam in the end, and then it doesn't matter what path someone took? Right, but imagine that you're a director of bioinformatics at Illumina, and you're hiring somebody from UCSD, and you have grades A, B, C. Imagine that the only thing you're interested in is of what learning breakdowns you experience in your bioinformatics one course. That's very valuable information, right? You learn a lot about a person by learning. You learn how quickly a person goes through the class. So there are, I think that will be, this learning process will represent very valuable piece of information. Hi, thank you for this lecture. Thank you for speaking about teaching in a keynote, which we don't hear enough about. Um, for those of us who cannot invest 7,000 plus hours, from your experience of building this, do you have advice on how to already improve classrooms with more limited means? Uh, so you want to if you want to contribute to development of the uh, online course, we are totally open. And we actually invited all professors, there are over 50 of them who are using our materials to contribute to our educational content. If you are talking how to run the class, I can tell you how I run the class. I walk in the class and I ask people, and actually people are expected to file the learning breakdown before the class. At 10 a.m. in the morning, our class starts, let's say, at 5. I work hard from 10 a.m. till 5 a.m., 5 p.m. to figure out what learning breakdowns every student in my class had. And then I prepare a custom-made PowerPoint answering this learning breakdown. And students in the class help me, those who didn't have, to answer this question. So there is continuous interaction in the class between me and student and student to be student. So that's one way of how to, you don't need to have 7,000 hours to do something like this. You can use existing material, add your own material to run your own class. And many people are doing this right now. Pavel here. Um, I'm interested in uh, your thoughts about the life cycle of such a course. So you contrasted high school geometry by what you call a complex discipline. And um, the content of high school geometry, I guess, will be about the same in 50 years as it is today. But our, our disciplines are very elastic. And uh, so the lifetime of the course is going to be short or the evolutionary rate of the course is going to be very high. And so your uh, immense initial investment is in danger of you know, being, being uh, prolonged and being repeated on and on. So does that scale? Or what do you do in order to make it scale? It, uh, it definitely works for uh, so solid courses like calculus or algorithms. The content doesn't change much. The content of bioinformatics course changed a lot. Uh, but at some point, I talked to Daphne Kaur, founder of Coursera, who now left Coursera, and she told me that she envisioned that for every course with a sufficient number of students, and bioinformatics today, I believe, has this sufficient number of students above the threshold that Daphne Kaur kept in mind, she envisions that at least a million dollars will be invested into a course to develop this. And of course, it has to be to constantly maintained. And that's why it's important to, I showed this messy closet. We want to different people at the forefront of our discipline to contribute. And I'm inviting everybody, if you want to contribute and make video and add programming challenges, we are completely open to this. One more, uh, one more last question. 
even not questions more comment i uh, must to stay say you thank you very much not for this for talk but for stepic i didn't know that you participate you but i can confirm i'm a white mouse a pure biologist who are trying improve statistics and our programming now i tried many online courses coursera etc and i can say that stepic approach is most effective approaches for me even for same reasons, but I can control each my step. I, if I do not understand small topic, I can go back, repeat it, and test uh, again. So I'm confirmed it's really working because I'm uh, not very smart student. Uh, <laughs> and trust me, I am biologist. And the second uh, thing that I should to say uh, that we are talking about profits from uh, groups, from communications. Don't forget about people who have a problem with communications. I have a son who has a problem even in middle school to work in big group. It's not a profit for him to have 40 person in class, people in class. It is a big stress for him and now we are searching a way to adapt him. I think in high school it's even more actual problem. There are people who need 40 person around to be effective, but there are people who are just stressed by this uh, system and th this approach could be uh, use, uh, useful for them too. Thank you very much for your job. I will be happy and join it. Join it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> we have to leave it here. Pleasure for me to handle the actual award. Thank you. Take it here. Thank you. Well, you came here with me to make some pictures. Okay.